can you um, share your screen? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much for the introduction. And um, yeah, thanks Jeff. And also thanks Sean for inviting me to giving this talk. And I would like to thank also all the people connected. Uh, I'm Claudia Paris. I'm assistant professor at the University of Trento in the remote sensing laboratory. And uh, today I would like to share with you this nice, in my opinion, topic, which is related to the remote sensing data labeling challenge. So I think you can see my slides. And here I just reported one of the most important uh, remote sensing data that allow us to do a very comprehensive environmental analysis. And you know that we have this valuable source of information that really allow us to have uh, an insight of the different processes that are on the Earth surface. So basically, according to the different properties that we want to, to retrieve, we can use different kinds of sensors. Here we can see, for instance, the LiDAR data to measure the three-dimensional structure of typical forests, multispectral, hyperspectral sensor, SAR sensor. And the nice part, in my opinion, is that nowadays these sensors are mounted on satellite more and more frequently in the sense that European Space Agency, but also at NASA and other space agency, are investing a lot of effort to uh, constantly monitoring our planet. So we are really in the condition of collecting a lot of data um, and to constantly check what is happening on our planet by having multi-source, uh, multi-modal information. So we are definitely in the big data paradigm, which is very nice because we are in the condition of having a lot of information, valuable information about our, uh, our environment. But of course, we need also to collect this information somehow. And the nice part, in my opinion, is that uh, in the last uh, decades, what we saw uh, was the availability of these data, um, fortunately, open and full of access. So here in the slide, I was just reporting few archives where you can dig in and find totally free remote sensing data of different kind, um, acquired by different kinds of sensors. Uh, and this is, in my opinion, very important because it allows to everyone to have a brilliant idea and to have the research to move ahead fast because we have the access to this data without any cost. Uh, although this is nice, and of course, I mean, um, it's, it's good to have access to these kind of archives. It's not very nice when you want to perform a large scale analysis to download all the data locally, process them, and then maybe upload your results somewhere. In this sense, another ingredient, another piece of information that is extremely interesting is the possibility of having cloud computing platform. So again, here in the slides, I was not inserting a comprehensive overview of the different cloud computing platforms. Uh, I was just mentioning some of them, but it's nice because you can use your own laptop without having an crazy important or efficient machines. And thanks to this kind of cloud computing platform, for instance, the Google Earth Engine is one of the uh, most employed also for research, you have two important aspects. First of all, you can dig into the archives and to retrieve whatever data you want without the need of downloading a huge amount of data. As I told you before, I mean, we are really in the paradigm of the big data, so it's tough to have also space if you want to perform a large scale multi-temporal analysis. So uh, this is very nice. And second of all, you also have the cloud computing resources. So seriously, from your laptop, you can perform large scale analysis to environmental monitor or whatever is your purpose. Again, for thematic exploitation platforms and alliances. And this is more and more, um, let's say, studied and offered by the space agency in order to let people also to do this kind of analysis in a fast and efficient way, since not everyone can have the access to a performance computer in his own company, university, and so on and so forth. So basically, um, all this brief introduction was simply to mention that now we are in the condition, in my opinion, also thanks to the development of the technologies, to uh, perform comprehensive environmental analysis at large scale. So the Earth observation research field is really moving in this direction more than ever. Here we can see, for instance, uh, an image, a Sentinel-2 image, which is an optical multispectral sensor uh, that was launched in 2015. Uh, acquired over my region. I'm, I'm in Italy, I'm in the, in the Trentino region, in the southern Italian Alps, north part. And as we can see, we have a lot of detail. We have high spatial resolution data, 10 meters. And this sensor in particular, but this is just an example, is able to acquire data up to um, every five days, which means that we really constantly check our planet with um, high spatial and high spectral uh, analysis for, for this specific peculiar example. 
um, this really opens to the possibility to do, um, as I mentioned before, such analysis um, no more at local or regional scale as we were used to, but all the elements that I was mentioning related to the computer resources, the open data archives, uh, uh, and the possibility to have such nice uh, data um, that is also multimodal and multi-source, uh, allow us to, uh, to have more insight, in my opinion, in the dynamic processes that are now occurring on our planet. Uh, and now, I mean, we are moving at country, continental and global scale. I mean, the research is really going in this direction. So all the elements are very nice, but the main problem is the uh, remote sensor data labeling challenge. So the main, the main goal of the talk, the fact that okay, it's good to have open access to remote sensing data, it's nice to have access to resources, computing resources, but we need to train our model. And we are seriously going in the direction in the last year of the benchmark dataset rush. I mean, here in, in the slides, we can see the, the comparison with the gold rush in the sense that seriously in the last year, and we are keep doing that, uh, we are putting a lot of effort in trying to uh, share with the community large scale benchmark archives. And uh, this is amazing again, because um, now, I mean, you are all probably fully aware that deep learning is totally changing uh, the way we are doing earth observation. Uh, in the computer vision community that started before, for them it's a little bit easier to collect uh, reference data because labeling natural images, of course, is more intuitive um, require less effort. In the remote sensing community, this is not trivial. I will enter in some details later. Uh, but we understood and we saw that in the last years, very nice environmental analysis uh, from the operational viewpoint, from the research viewpoint, were performed using deep learning algorithm. But this can be done to train successfully our um, our uh, deep learning model, just if we have enough labeled data set. So these benchmark uh, were done for this purpose. And in my opinion, they're also amazing because we can seriously compare the different system architecture that we are developing. If we have a benchmark data set, we are in the condition of really understanding uh, the different performances of method developed for same purposes. So here in the slide, I was mentioning uh, the most important, let's say, or most used deep learning model applied to remote sensing data, like the convolutional that is exploiting the spatial information, log shorter memory, the temporal information, which is extremely important in our community. Attention is all you need, which is another important deep learning model that we saw. Uh, however, the main point is that even though these benchmark data set are a real valuable source of information, and it's amazing to see uh, all the effort that the community is doing to share this data set. Uh, it is not obvious that such data set uh, are good for our analysis. So for instance, uh, here I wanted to just report an example to open the discussion. From the operational viewpoint, sometimes if you have to perform a peculiar environmental analysis in a specific study area, you are, I mean, it's not obvious, it's not trivial to say, okay, I may rely on an existing benchmark data set. For instance, here in this study, what we were doing was to compare the results that we obtained on Sentinel-2 images by using one of the first benchmark data set uh, uh, related to Sentinel-2 patches, which is basically Aerosat of 20, uh, 27,000 labeled patches collected all over Europe, and the local data set made up of weak samples because we were uh, basically retrieving this information from a land cover map. So the, it was not totally, um, let's say, 100% accurate. I will, I will enter in the detail during the presentation of the way we retrieve this data set. But the main point of the study was simply to highlight the fact that sometimes with remote sensing, it's not so easy to uh, deal with benchmark data set. Also in this sense, it is a little bit different in my opinion with respect to the computer vision community. Uh, for instance, for the multispectral data, the example that here I have in the slides, uh, for different geographical location, we have the spatial variability of the spectral signature for the humidity, soil condition, topography, the different acquisition condition, the illumination, the atmosphere, the season, the atmospheric correction adopted. So what we wanted to highlight uh, uh, is that although the benchmark data set are a valuable resource, especially for training the model and compare method, sometimes they are not perfect for doing operational analysis um, and environmental analysis at large scale. They cannot be used for everything, let's say. So here in the comparison, as I mentioned, we were retrieving a local data set. Again, in my region, as you can see, the test set and the training set, they were different because we didn't want to have overlapping patches 
uh, to a statistical reliable analysis. Uh, we were just using one sentinel to image. The idea was to use a very uh, easy deep learning model just to, to check these, uh, these results. And the Aerosol data set, uh, um, as I mentioned before, was made up of manually annotated sentinel to images collected over different countries. However, I mean, compared to the same amount of samples, we couldn't use the full data set because we were using just these six classes. Compared to the local samples made up of weak labels that we were uh, able to extract from an existing land cover map, so without manual annotation, it was totally, it was totally unsupervised. Uh, of course, the local data set, for all the, the reason that I was mentioning with, before, was achieving better results with respect to the aerosol both using the CNN from scratch and using a fine-tuning deep learning model. Again, for all the issues that uh, makes remote sensing tricky sometimes, sometimes from the operational viewpoint. So here we are. I mean, all the introduction was just to uh, bring you here. Uh, the main issue, every time that I have uh, an, an operational uh, problem, so I wanted to solve some uh, um, analysis from the environmental viewpoint of the Earth observation, research question, and so on and so forth. Uh, what do we have to do, basically? And on one side, we can see on the left that we have different kind of labeled data sources. So basically, in situ data, visual annotation, of data maps, and ancillary data. But don't forget that machine learning is always on your side. So on the right part, we can see transfer learning, self-page learning, semi-supervised and active learning. Why am I mentioning this? Because during the talk, I would like to have a very brief overview, first from the labeled data sources, and then um, to make some example on how to use the learning paradigms to support the construction of your own data set. Of course, again, this is not comprehensive. There are uh, much more than this, but this is, let's say, a starting point for having brainstorming. So here I wanted to report the example for the different level of data sources, uh, and I summarized them in four main categories, the in-situ measurement, ancillary data, visual annotation, and outdated maps. So let me start from the in-situ measurement, which is, let's say, the basis of the remote sensing community. We started by collecting measures on the ground. We can see here our friend that is measuring uh, the stem of, of a tree. Um, of course, I mean, yes, to go in situ in order to retrieve this information. I also did it. I went twice to some field campaigns for forest structure um, analysis. So I'm really, I'm, I mean, I'm sympathetic with him. I, I know what does it mean. And it's true that these kind of field surveys are extremely important because uh, they really give you the insight on the condition of the environment that you are measuring and also allow you to better understand uh, how to relate the information that you wanted to estimate with your remote sensing data, so the reality with your sensor information. But they are extremely costly and time consuming. So I spent a couple of weeks, I, if I remember correctly, in California collecting data. Uh, the measurement were not that much, honestly. Although we were waking up at 5 a.m. and we stopped to take measurement at 5 p.m., uh, seriously, I mean, I, I swear. Uh, but the point is that, jokes aside, I mean, it's really difficult to collect this kind of measurement and it's really costly, so we cannot really rely on this. However, on this part, before moving to the next step, I wanted to mention these important uh, in situ measurement databases. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I encourage you to explore it because it's a very good one. It's basically the Lucas database is land use, land cover area frame statistical surveys carried out by the European community at European level. Of course, it's continental. It is very nice, in my opinion, they were collecting in situ measurement. They have a very strict protocol uh, to drive uh, their expert to collect the measurement that are harmonized because it's not easy to have the same way to collect the measurement at continental level. On the left, we can see that is a very detailed uh, um, classification scheme, so a lot of categories. And basically, uh, yeah, it covers the most important land cover categories that we use also in remote sensing. And we can see that they are updating it every three years. So the last one, for instance, was in 2018. They also provide the pictures so this kind of data set really allows to have a lot of information. Uh, they put a lot of effort. It's a huge project. Uh, so in 2018, the last published uh, survey, it was including 330,000 points. Uh, so it's a huge amount of data if you think about the fact that we are collecting it in situ. However, as you imagine, if, if uh, some of you are familiar with deep learning, sometimes even though this amount of data seems to be huge, they are not enough to train, for instance, a deep model. So. 
uh, it is very good for validation. There are some works that are using this kind of databases also to train shallow model. But again, I mean, this is a very peculiar example and it's very difficult to collect a lot of uh, ground information for your application if you want to move at large scale. So the second lovely data sources that you may want to investigate for your purpose and your research goal is ancillary data. And here I was, let's say, inserting my different kind of ancillary data in the sense that I was including the regional or local administrative databases. You will be surprised um, when you start an environmental analysis to see how many local information you may retrieve uh, according to the specific study area you are interested in. Population census data, sometimes they are connected with the environment so they can be useful for us. And crowdsourcing databases. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but OpenStreetMap is more and more used now um, in our community to retrieve uh, training uh, level samples. However, I mean, although this is again a valuable source of information, keep in mind that all these kind of data were not meant for your peculiar analysis. So there may be a semantic gap between the information provided by these databases and the remote sensing data you're using. They focus on peculiar link cover and you need when you're using multiple sources to really harmonize them and to check them before using it. So here in the slide, I was reporting a couple of examples. The OpenStreetMap that is based on volunteer geographic information. Uh, it's, it's really a valuable source of information and I understand why in the community we are using it more and more. However, the problem is that since it is based on a volunteer uh, collection of samples, of course, it is um, more precise in some areas, especially in the cities, less in rural areas and in the, in the countries that are developing. So it's not an homogeneous source of information. It really depends on the study area you want to investigate. And then, for instance, but this is just an example, uh, we have population census that sometimes are really connected with the environment. A nice uh, example that I would like to, to share with you um, was a work that we developed within a project, the Extreme Art Project, the European uh, project where they asked us to perform a crop type mapping and they wanted us to train a deep learning model. So we were basically struggling to look for uh, enough crop type uh, labelled samples to train successfully our model. And it turned out that in Europe, there are a lot of countries that are sharing databases um, that are collecting farmers declaration. So this is very nice because the farmer is directly telling you what is the crop that is cultivating uh, in his own field, you know? And this is amazing because it's a huge amount of information for free. It was very nice in my opinion. What we did of course, was not just to, take, to say, okay, nice. I mean, we have this information, let's train the deep model. I, encourage you not to do that. You really have to analyze a little bit the source of information you're using, understand your goal, and try to select the most reliable samples. So don't forget that the quality and quantity of your training set is necessary and fundamental to achieve um, analysis, accurate analysis uh, from the machine learning, deep learning uh, viewpoint. So here, what we were doing was to develop this uh, system architecture to achieve the crop type maps automatically, not just in Austria, but also in the surrounding areas. Um, uh, sorry, I see that there is a, a raised hand. I don't know if we want to have the questions at the end of the, of the talk, uh, Michael, or if we want to have interact for me, it's fine. Uh, let's wait till the end, um, just okay. to make it uh, easier, more fluid. Okay, Thank don't you. worry. Okay, so I, I will keep going. Okay, good. Yes, um, please. Uh, so basically, uh, here we were um, analyzing first our databases. What I was mentioning before when I told you, please don't just take the database and use it, is that every time you have to understand the data sources. I mean, the farmer were free to declare whatever they wanted. There were double co co cultivation per crop. Maybe there is the rotation practice, so they were telling exactly what they were doing. Unclear statements, something like other surfaces. There were strong semantic aggregation. Some were like declaring other agricultural cropland. I mean, totally fine because this was a farmer declaration, but not useful for our purpose, for instance. So, and keep in mind also that in this case, the geometry of the fields were declared from the administrative viewpoint. Another issue that we have to take into account that even though the source of information was very good in my opinion, uh, of course, sometimes the administrative boundaries are not matching perfectly our remote sensing data in the sense that although the guy, I mean, has specific crop boundaries, maybe the cultivation has a different shape. And this is something that you should know. Otherwise you are assigning the wrong label uh, to the wrong spectral signature or remote sensing data, whatever. 
So um, what we did was, of course, since we wanted to do some agricultural classification, analyze our multi-temporal data, generate a multi-temporal data set to uh, catch the phenological trend of our crops, and then defining an unsupervised architecture uh, without the need of interacting with the user because we wanted to have a very large database of samples that allow us to retrieve the information from the map that were really useful for our goal. So we first performed a stratified random sampling in order to have something that was reliable, so representative of the statistically amount of samples present in the scene. Don't forget this, this kind of information in databases or maps is very precious because you need to know to balance the amount of samples in your class according to the statistical properties of the study area. Then we were training a deep model to check the posterior and also the preliminary map because we wanted to select just those samples that were the most reliable because I wanted to be sure that the quality of the training databases was very high in order to have a successfully trained of my deep learning model. We were able to retrieve more than 1 million labelled samples, totaling in an unsupervised way thanks to these uh, precious ancillary data that this is why I wanted to mention today in the talk. And we were able to retrieve uh, crop time maps, not just for Austria, but also in the surrounding areas, according to the high quality that, of information that we had at the beginning. And it was also a very, uh, let's say, um, nice classification scheme um, very detailed one that allow us to achieve, in my opinion, a good, a good data set that we are basically sharing with the community soon because we are just um, closing the revision of the, of the paper on this part. So another important step is the visual annotation. This is, uh, let's say, the counterpart of in-situ measurement. We are in the condition of asking to some expert photo interpreter not to go directly uh, in, the, in the field, uh, um, but to uh, stay in front of his PC and to try to understand what he's looking at. This is still very demanding, especially at large scale, and there is the need to have the access to a huge set of ancillary data, aerial photography, because it's not just that you are looking to something and is enough. Also because some land cover are really difficult to annotate without ancillary data. Here, I mean, I just sketched an example that was a real one in a project. We wanted to understand what we were looking in Siberia, which is kind of difficult to, to reach. This is why we didn't want to have field measurements. But it was very tricky to understand, is this aquatic booty vegetation or herbaceous? So it's not easy. And another important aspect of the visual annotation that I wanted to stress is that, of course, it's very nice because if you have experts, you can retrieve high quality samples. But in this paper, an important thing that they were highlighting is that differently from field measurement, it's easier to make mistakes because you are not there. So it's important, in my opinion, if you have a visual annotation databases to also indicate, um, yeah, and the trustworthiness of these labels and to have a pool of experts to try to have somehow, uh, let's say, uh, an ensemble of, uh, of labels in order to reduce the noise. Because again, the quality of your samples is, is the most important part. I mean, as, is as important as the learning paradigms. They did these analyses at large scale and I think it is very demanding when you do this kind of, of work. Uh, uh, yeah important level, I mean, honestly. So visual annotation is precious, but is as difficult as the field measurement. So something that I, I wanted to mention that I also anticipated before is that fortunately, at least now it's easier to retrieve uh, and to have the access to many different kinds of data sources, remote sensing data sources. Here I was representing the Google Earth Engine, which is simply an example of uh, archive where you can, if you want to label, not just have the access to different kinds of remote sensing data, high resolution area images, but even thematic maps. For instance, here I was reporting the Copernicus Global Land Cover Map of 2015 from the European Community, and maybe it may help to have this kind of ancillary data to better understand what you are labeling. So I guess that differently from the past, this is much easier. And I encourage you to use these kind of tools for this reason. Uh, the last but not the least, and I want to dedicate a little bit more time on this because we worked a lot in our group on this part, are the thematic maps. We are not as lucky as the example of the farmer-based declaration because when you have a map, a thematic map available, it is the product and the output of a machine learning model and so on and so forth. So it's not 100% reliable. It's not the, the, the farmer that is telling you what he did. 
It is typically aggregated at polygon level. We were um, slightly mentioning this before with the example of the crop. And there is typically a semantic gap between the map and the remote sensing data. However, I truly think that this is the nice direction to collect a lot of samples at large scale in an unsupervised way. Also because there is a lot of effort related to the production of this kind of maps. For many different reasons, for many different environmental analyses, socio-economic analyses. Seriously, the community is working hard to achieve this goal and the direction is to have them as more um, high spatial resolution as possible. So they are totally uh, free, let's say. So they are there. And I think that is really valuable to use and employ this kind of information. Here, for instance, I was uh, providing an example of Africa, a resolution maps that are available at 30 meter and 20 meter for different projects. Uh, what I wanted to stress in this example and this slide is that sometimes, according to the different goal, you have very different classification scheme. So again, if you want to perform a peculiar environmental analysis, keep in mind what is your goal and try to select the land cover map that is more in line with the information that you're looking at. As I mentioned, don't forget that these are maps, these are product, output product of uh, the machine learning method of someone else, so, or I don't know, maybe even photo interpretation and whatever, but still, they are not perfectly reliable. In this nice paper, they were comparing these four products uh, um, that were basically representing the Africa land cover. They first harmonized the legend because they were totally different, but um, they were able to harmonize them in these seven main land cover categories. And I think it's very interesting to see the agreement of these maps that were not that bad, honestly, taken at, at singular level, which is very low in some areas. So keep in mind that this is not 100% reliable, of course, and sometimes they are also updated. So if you want to um, check for uh, um, uh, recent remote sensing data, you have to, to take into account this part. For this reason, what we did was to try to develop a method that was able, again, in an unsupervised way, to try to dig a little bit in the information that the map was providing. Uh, here, for instance, they were asking us for a project to update an existing crop type map. Again, this time was not a farmer-based declaration. It was the product of the Sent to Agri project founded by the European Space Agency. They did a great job, in my opinion. It was an agricultural map of the Czech Republic. Uh, the map was in 2015 and was based on Landsat. And they asked us to provide a 2016 map by using Sentinel. So it was very challenging and very interesting. Uh, but we just have the map, we didn't have anything else. What we did was uh, first to understand the source domain, so the spatial properly, properties, the semantic properties, and then we understood that we had to decompose this information to retrieve as pure pixel as possible to generate our databases of weak labeled units because we are retrieving them from a map without any other source of information. And then, of course, we need to adapt them according to the new year that we wanted to classify to generate the map of 2016. I wanted to share this example, qualitative one that is more clear maybe than the block scheme. Here we can see the original map that was defined at time T1, which was 2015. And we were first looking to our Landsat data set. So we were like checking and trying to understand if there was somehow spatial aggregation similar to the farmer declaration problem. But here it was even more evident because of the fact that this is a, an output product of, of, the, of the project. So after that, after retrieving the real information that was there, thanks to the, the remote sensing data, we understood that the, the other problem was the legend. I mean, this is totally normal that sometimes the output legend of a map is semantically aggregated. It's a standard to have spring cereal, winter cereal, cereal annual crops, this kind of stuff. However, if you want to train your own classification uh, model, what you have to do is to be sure that the system is ingesting all the natural classes present in the scene. So if spring cereal, for instance, is made up of three different natural classes and you just give to the classifier two of them, you won't be able to recognize the third one. So here, what we were doing was to work hard to do a semantic decomposition. We were not interested in the real name of these uh, natural classes, but we wanted to, to retrieve all the elements that were present in the scene to let the classifier know what he was looking at and then generate the updated map. Uh, this is, a, I think, a nice example where you can see what I was referring when I mentioned that basically you are jointly using 
both uh, the information provided by the updated maps and the remote sensing data. If you merge them, you have the complete picture of the story. And as you can see, according to our step, we were able to get results that were in line with what you could see in the NDVI trend or the true color composition. Uh, we retrieve in this label a data set and we could use it on, on Sentinel-2, even though at the beginning we were using Landsat because at the end it was simply a database with location, pixel location. The nice part is that uh, we were able to update uh, uh, the agricultural map um, of the wool Czech Republic in a totally unsupervised way. They gave us the validation data set. They also uh, generated a 2016 map so we could compare our results with them. And it was amazing to see that we were in the condition of having very nice results comparable to the one that they had by training the supervised method. Uh, for two main reasons. First of all, of course, their map was very good, so the one the starting point was good. And second of all, I mean, we were in the condition, thanks to the map, we had to struggle more to understand how to create our training set, but we have a lot of samples. We were in the condition of having a large database of samples, maybe more than the one that they had to train their own uh, method. So the, the results were very interesting. And the similar analysis, but a little bit different because the framework was different, was done um, to update the Corinland cover map, which is basically a map available at the European level for the Italian country. In 2018, this map that has a minimum mapping unit of 25 hectares and the raster um, uh, spatial resolution of 10 meters, uh, was provided to the community and we wanted to see if we were able to increase the spatial resolution at 10 meter by using, uh, sorry, the map is 100 meter. We wanted to increase the spatial resolution at 10 meter with Sentinel-2. So first we were analyzing the Corinland cover legend. We were uh, defining our training set classes and our target legend, which was based on the mainland covers. We did a different work with respect to agricultural part because actually the legend is different and map is different. We have a strong semantic and spatial aggregation because we are dealing also to 25 hectares polygon. So uh, it is very large if you want to check the, the, the information at 10 meters spatial resolution. And here in the slide, we can see that according to an analysis based on the spectral information, spectral indexes, retrieved from the Sentinel-2. For instance, if the polygon was associated to the urban level, and actually it is correct because most of the samples are basically buildings, uh, what we wanted to do in an automatic way was to filter this information to discard those samples that were not correctly associated to the urban pixels, for instance, the grassland present in the city, and just focus on those pixels that were really buildings. Uh, we use the Lucas database, I don't know if you remember the one that I mentioned before, for validation. So we had the 26,000 samples, more than 26,000 samples available. And it was good to have this kind of validation because it was statistically independent and it was a way to really check the quality of the results obtained. Of course, I mean, this data set uh, uh, tells you that each point has a radius of 20 meters. So for instance, we can see in the bottom um, left part of the slides that the point uh, um, is, is referring to conifers, but not because the point is exactly on a tree, because the expert is looking at conifers around him. So to match our uh, spatial resolution, we were using the window, three by three window, which is the standard. And we were able to have very nice results. We were detecting the, the quality of these mainland covers for the old country and for the different part uh, of our country, because the, the climate is very different from north to the south and for the island. And actually the results were very stable, again, because the main point is that if you're in the condition of retrieving uh, high quality and reliable samples, you have a lot of information because you can even uh, generate a training set per tile. So for each different Sentinel-2 image. In this case, I'm serious because we were doing a multi-temporal classification. And here we can see some qualitative example to give you the flavor a little bit of the spatial aggregation of the initial land cover map. Uh, that is done by photo interpretation, by the way, is not an output of, a, of a, um, a machine learning product, but is a mix of sources, ancillary data, and so on. And the results that we obtained, we were able to achieve also a nice spatial resolution um, map at 10 meter, thanks to the Sentinel-2 data information. And as you can see, we were recovering details present in the scene, like, for instance, the river that was not large enough to be included in the initial map because of the aggregation problem. But again, I mean, if you just extract the samples from the Corinna and you try to classify, 
you may be lucky or not. It depends on the amount of noise that you are inserting, if you are using a noise robust classifier, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, now more or less I, I gave a very fast overview on the LabLab data sources. Uh, I know that my time is almost over, but I wanted to give a little bit of insight very fast, also related to the learning paradigms. I anticipated at the beginning that machine learning is on our side, so let's use it. Uh, the main point is that it's true that we have different LabLab data sources, but it's also true that we have a lot of instruments to better understand and employ them. So for each samples that we have in the initial training set and for each sample we want to recollect in a semi-supervised, unsupervised way, we can always understand how the classifier or the system we are using to generate our product is confident or not to give the label to the samples. And this is a huge amount of information that we have to keep uh, in mind every time. I encourage you, this is a very um, nice taxonomy, in my opinion, on the different remote sensing data pro uh, problems. Uh, I encourage you every time that you have this kind of um, needs uh, in terms of operational analysis to understand what is the problem that you're facing according to the training databases, the starting point that you have. Is your training set really representative of your study area? is representative of all the classes. Are you in the condition of having a domain adaptation problem where the domains are correlated but different or maybe learning under sample selection bias, covariate shift and so on. So you need to know where you are before starting to also collect and refining your training databases. Uh, here, for instance, uh, um, we had uh, some reference data. We are again in, in my region, of course. We had two different locations, Padagnone and Valdisella. They were similar but different because they were far enough to have hyperspectral data um, with very different uh, um, distribution in terms of land cover classes due to the different topography, soil humidity, and so on and so forth. So if I had ground truth in one area, I couldn't directly reuse it on the other one. Here we can see in the slides that basically, for instance, the urban class in the same spectral channel of the same hyperspectral sensor were totally shifted in the future space, which means that if you apply a classifier training on one, uh, one domain to the other, you are going to have a mess because uh, this kind of distribution, they are not basically talking to each other. They are not aligned. So what we were doing here, but this is just an example, there are many in the literature, we were relying on the physical measurements collected by the sensor. We were considering hyperspectral data and LiDAR data, which is a laser sent, uh, sensor uh, that is able to retrieve the altitude of the, of the scene. And basically we were using this information in a sensor driven way to help our um, model to, uh, let's say, infer knowledge, to transfer knowledge from one domain to another. So, pretty sure that the building, I hope so, is higher than the road. Of course, generally speaking, this is a very easy example. Or the chlorophyll is having a different impact if I look to a forest or to the building. So the NDVI has a totally different uh, result. And if I'm looking now to the feature spaces on the right that I generate with this sensor driven feature, I can see that they are aligned. So they are basically talking to each other. So if I apply the classifier there, I'm able to uh, achieve reasonable results. But again, this is just an easy example to let you uh, yeah, think a little bit on the fact that by using the proper learning paradigms, maybe you can extend, um, enlarge, or create other uh, training samples in, in other areas. Another thing that I wanted to highlight is the self-paced learning uh, paradigm that is very recent and very powerful in my opinion. Uh, is, is mimicking our human being process to learn. So starting from easy example and little by little, iteratively moving to more complex samples. And apparently, I mean, it's giving very nice results because you are driving uh, in a semi-supervised way, you are driving your classifier um, uh, rule in order to adjust according to the capability of uh, learning from easy example to more difficult examples. And especially if uh, by active learning, I mean, you can really boost the performance and in few iteration with few level samples, um, uh, let's say adjust uh, the classifier in a very nice way to a new study area. So finally, the active learning that I just mentioned, which is, uh, uh, let's say, a smart way to collect samples with photo interpretation. So active learning is 
interacting between the photo interpreter and the classifier is asking to the classifier the more uncertain samples, so the samples that is in difficult to, to classify, which are the more informative, because basically it means that this information is not properly captured. Uh, so instead of labeling randomly stuff, you can uh, try to explore this active learning paradigm to uh, improve and boost the performance by collecting few samples uh, in order to improve the, the, the classifier. And also in this case, the Google Earth Engine platform is very nice, again, as I mentioned for the visual annotation, to add the support on many different ancillary data and DVI trend from the temporal viewpoint, uh, different kinds of images and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, I think that um, our, our, let's say, tour inside this kind of level of data sources and uh, learning paradigm is almost, uh, is almost finished, let's say. Again, this is not comprehensive, it's just a way to introduce and open the discussion. Uh, however, it's very difficult to define system architecture that have high general, generalization capability when you want to achieve uh, results on large scale, because typically the environment is very heterogeneous. So I was inserting other keywords that I didn't mention today, uh, pre-trained network, fine-tuning strategies, considering the uncertainty measure of each lablet samples, multi-temporal data correlation and data augmentation, which are nice ingredients that may help you again in this, in this play, in this, let's say, um, playing with these elements for this problem. So thank you very much for, uh, um, for your attention. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm available here for, for questions. Thank you, Dr. Paris. That was a really great talk. Um, I just wanted to start off the Q&A just by mentioning that this talk, um, when the recording is complete and processed, we will, we will upload it to our YouTube channel and uh, send some sort of notification uh, that it's available. Um, so I think we might uh, start at the first question that was posted. I don't know who had raised their hand, um, but I know the first question that was posted in the chat channel by Jaden, if you want to unmute and ask, or I'm happy to ask the question, or you can, you can read it yourself as well, uh, Dr. Paris. Yeah, so maybe I have to stop sharing. Um, yeah. Let's um, in beginning. the chat, uh, it looks like... Um, <clears throat> Okay, so what approach did you follow for the visual annotation? Well, okay, uh, was there multiple uh, rounds of annotation uh, to uncertain the quality? Did you validate the annotation after the algorithm was run? Uh, I think that somehow I, I replied to this question maybe at the end of the talk. I didn't mention about the active learning strategy at that uh, moment because, I mean, it is not uh, necessary. I also suggest to do again some random sampling because sometimes active learning can driven you to specific path, so it's not obvious to, uh, to just follow uh, it in order to achieve good results. But in my opinion, the best way to do visual annotation, if you can do that, if you have a pool of expert annotators, so to have more than one opinion per samples, to do it iteratively. And if you can do that, uh, interactively uh, check the quality of your classifier and select the most informative and uncertain samples together with some random samples uh, um, in order to be sure that you're properly, um, let's say, capturing the whole picture. Another important thing is always to keep in mind the prior probabilities of the classes. So uh, don't, don't do the, the, let's say, homogeneous sampling. Uh, you have to study a little bit of the study area and then understand which are the major classes and try to mimicking these statistical, um, let's say, uh, analysis also with the amount of samples that you collect. So uh, try to have a minimum amount of samples per class, but try to be statistically reasonable in order to represent the study area. Okay, great. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, see there are a few raised hands. I'll, I'll call on some of those individuals and, and let them okay, ask great. the question. Thanks. Uh, so I think Christian Sanchez, I'll unmute you. Are you gonna unmute yourself? Yes, hi. Thanks for the presentation, it was nice. Um, I have two questions. Uh, First, um, how did you evaluate the models or how are you, uh, are you evaluating the models? Like which metric are you using to know how well is it? Okay, uh, do, you want, yeah. do you want me to reply or do you want to tell me? Yes, you, yeah, please. 
Okay. Uh, it depends, of course. For the classification method, usually I use a score, overall accuracy, user accuracy, and producer accuracy. And I try to have a validation database that is totally independent, like the Lucas one. So the one that I was mentioning that is based on ground surveys from the European community is a totally statistical independent source of information. You are not involved in the validation because it doesn't matter how honest you are. Since you did the method, you try every time to... <laughs> Uh, yeah, be, um, I don't know to say as fair as possible, but you are a little bit uh, biased on this. Uh, so in my opinion, for the classification, these are the metrics. If I do regression, is root mean square error, uh, correlation um, uh, coefficient. Uh, so it's really depend on, on the kind of, uh, um, yeah, of, of model that you have to train. So you, um, because I, I could uh, evaluate with uh, IOU, uh, intersection over union. Did you try out that? Or? Um, it never happened to me. I mean, I, I think it is a valuable yeah, source of information. Um, you know, for validation, I try every time to have a, a certain measure. Because while for training data, in my opinion, you may rely on uh, uh, different kind of um, sources. For validation, you have to, to be sure that the measure are correct, uh, because this is the way you really evaluate the performer. So um, yeah, but but yeah, it's fine, of course. All right, thanks. Thank, Thank you, you for your questions. Uh, it looks like uh, Deep Prakash Sarkar, uh, if you want to ask your question. Yes, we hear you. Yeah, actually, uh, thank you very much for such a nice presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, it's kind of confusing, like uh, uh, in your case, uh, it's kind of, I can understand that you are uh, using that uh, pixel-based method to estimate uh, whichever class is present there in the, on the ground. But uh, when uh, we talk about uh, deep learning aspects, then uh, it's like, you know, we can uh, supply like, you know, sets of images for uh, each type of class. So uh, there is a kind of a distinction between that. So it's kind of confusing for me. So if you clear that part, uh, that would be great. Yeah, actually it depends, of course, on the kind of application again. So if you're doing some, for instance, crop type analysis like the one that I was presenting, it's true that the contextual information is important, but maybe the most important information is the phenological info mm, a trend of the crop at pixel level. And maybe you can aggregate it later with some object-based analysis. Uh, I totally agree with you that sometimes, for instance, with convolutional neural network, you have the contextual information that is as important as the pixel one. So uh, let's try to see the, all the elements that I was just presenting to give a brainstorming um, as starting point in the sense that according to the feature extraction method that you employ, if you use a deep learning model to extract features, you are embedding the contextual information within the pixel, let's say, the labeled samples, the labeled patch, according to your, your goal. And um, so you can even discriminate land use, not just land cover uh, information, for instance. So it's really depend uh, on, on the specific um, goal that you want to achieve in this sense. So if you move to deep learning model, of course, uh, this can be more general, more broad, uh, and can be even more robust to different kind of information. Uh, uh, actually, I have one more question. Uh, there are uh, some different uh, sets of uh, open source data available there uh, for uh, deep learning model, and uh, we can use it in convolution neural network or anywhere. So the question is, uh, how reliable those data are? There is not much information. So can we really trust those, those data sets? Like there are some data sets in Kaggle, it's not freely available. So uh, like that. So yeah, if uh, we want to you know, make a robust system, then uh, we would like to, you know, uh, include some diverse features from uh, different sources. So is it possible to combine uh, data from different sources, like in a single platform? So, yeah, so that was my, that is my question. Yeah, I think it's absolutely correct in the sense that the more information you're able to integrate in a proper way, the more robust is your method. So uh, if I if I gave the message that the benchmark data set are not interesting at all for this goal, um, I was not saying the uh, I was not explaining in the, in the proper way because they are absolutely they are. I just wanted to say that they cannot be always the solution for the problem or they cannot be just the solution in the sense that you have to integrate with something else. You have to add some information of your local and peculiar or specific goal. But I absolutely agree with you that the more sources you are able to integrate and harmonize, 
the more obvious and heterogeneous um, information the deep model is able to, to learn and maybe is also able to, uh, yeah, you're able to define a very uh, robust uh, system architecture. So I agree with you on this. Uh, thank you very much, Claudia. That's a nice thank presentation you. anyway. Okay, looks like uh, Jaden, um, did you have a follow-up question? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Actually, I look forward to viewing this uh, presentation again once it is released. Uh, two quick questions on the visual annotation. Uh, so in your study, like, what was the total volume of visual annotation that was done? And uh, how was it compared to other methods like ancillary data and visual annotations uh, so, and, and in situ? So which was more, which was less? And what did you rely more on in your study? Thank you. Okay, thanks for the, for the questions. Uh, actually, there were different examples for different um, uh, analysis that we made. It was not uh, that we were using all these elements for the main goal. So it was really depending on the constraints and the goal of the specific uh, research issue, project, or analysis that we want to carry out. Um, sometimes the visual annotation is the only solution that you have if you have a very peculiar classification scheme in peculiar study areas where there are no other source of information. So I will say that it can be, let's say, a solution um, if you don't have other um, possibilities. Uh, so, for instance, in Europe, sometimes you have a lot of information, but just because, of course, I'm fully aware of them, but sometimes when you work uh, in Africa, uh, where actually there are a lot of maps nowadays, but in South America or in Siberia, there are less uh, products or ancillary data or in, in situ collection that you may rely on them. So, uh, yeah, the framework that I wanted to present, of course, was not uh, uh, suggesting to have uh, every time multi-source and use all the elements for uh, one goal, but just to keep in mind that these are main um, tools that we may have in order to solve our problem and achieve our goal. So in visual annotation, honestly, we were using it just for one project. Uh, of course, you have limited uh, um, resources in the sense that you cannot collect a huge amount of samples, but sometimes they are needed for peculiar leg covers that you may not, not uh, find in other uh, ancillary data or data sources. Cool, thank you very much. Thanks for the question. Uh, looks like Venkata, uh, do you have a question? Uh, if you can unmute. Yes. Yes, yes, I have a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cla Ms. Claudia, for the such a nice, uh, such a nice presentation. And my question is: uh, Are there any tools which you recommend for the for employing active learning or self-paced learning those techniques to do the labeling? I mean, uh, for example, Amazon SageMaker offers some tool uh, like Amazon Ground Truth labeling uh, tool. So I know only one tool. Uh, do you recommend any other tools which will make my task easier with respect to active learning, employing active learning to do labeling? Um, you mean other learning paradigms or if I suggest you to use self-paced and active learning jointly? I mean tools. I mean, those are the paradigms, but the specific, okay. do you have any tools in which you have already used? Oh, okay, no, actually, honestly, uh, I don't have them in mind. Typically for research, we always, uh, let's say, um, develop the, our own uh, product uh, and, and it's, it's not obvious sometimes to, uh, to find them shared. Honestly, I didn't dig in, in GitHub and the web to check if there are implementation. Uh, also because sometimes and on the specific active learning, unfortunately, uh, both the learning paradigms and specific peculiarities. Okay. So according again to your uh, method, it depends what you need uh, and how you want to define your active learning strategy, which is connected to the kind of system that you are using. So if you select, for instance, a support vector machine, there are kind of active learning that are evaluating the uncertainty, the diversity, the distance from the, uh, the and so on and so forth, but this is not more working if you're using a random forest. So I would say that um, I'm not sure you may find um, a tool that is in line with your immediately. Uh, okay. Yeah, for this reason. Also the self-page, how you select the criteria that an example is easy or not, how it becomes easy or difficult. I mean, the learning paradigms is general and is uh, easy, let's say, to understand it, but then you have to understand how to implement for your 
peculiar application. What means easy for your peculiar application? Again, if I use an SVM, maybe I can check the distance uh, from, from you know, the boundaries of the decision rule. But if I use another classifier, this is no more the case. So honestly, I, uh, I don't know what to suggest from the practical viewpoint as a tool. Okay, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, it does not look like there are any questions right now. Um, uh, actually, there are a few coming yeah, in. Yeah, maybe in the yeah. chat. Yeah. Uh, Suba. I think uh, I think there was this one, Jeff. How much is it possible that the samples or signatures, or for a particular class? will last as and when there is a temporal change and also for satellite types. Uh, okay, I think I got the point. The problem of the changes on the ground, uh, this is an issue in the remote sensing community. Uh, of course, if, as, as I mentioned before, there is not just one recipe. Uh, it's really depending on the specific first application and the, the, the content. I mean, the, the, let's say the, the constraints of your application. So. Unfortunately, there is not just uh, an easy reply for that. Um, it depends on the classification scheme. What do you mean for land cover? Uh, when is going to change? For instance, in the crop type map that we were doing, we were checking the agronomic years. It is not the solar year. It goes from September to September because at the end of September, you are changing the kind of crops. So every time you need to study the problem and to learn, uh, let's say the, the constraint of the specific problem to set uh, um, also the remote sensing analysis accordingly. Okay, and... Um, okay, I don't think... Uh, ah, there is another question. For idiosyncratic technology, such as in Africa or South America, must the robust system rely substantial visual annotation? I'm not sure I got the point here. Um, for instance, in Africa, I mean, there are a lot of uh, works uh, that are trying to, to, to classify the crop types uh, by using um, the multi-temporal information splitting in the two main season because it has a peculiar kind of climate. Uh, they are not doing visual annotation. I guess they were using uh, uh, some databases uh, that was available online uh, related to the crop type problem, honestly. So uh, I'm not sure I got the question here. Um, maybe if uh, uh, if you can add more details, uh, I can reply better because... Um... Okay, and there is the last question. So if uh, Todd Simon would like to add something more, maybe I can understand better his question. Sorry for that. The last one that I can read is, there is something called pre-labeling or pre-mapping that could help to generate new label data. Basically, you train the model. Sorry, I lost it. Okay. Basically, you train the model and get prediction for new data. Then those prediction, uh, you refine. Maybe that there is less to do than labeling everything from scratch. You just need to adjust the prediction. Of course, sometimes it is better to delete the full prediction and it is more consuming than labeling from scratch. It depends on the goal in the sense that what you have to do is just to label uh, or to, to classify your study area. I do agree that uh, you may adjust the prediction and that's all. But if you want to generate a label databases to be used for other issue, to enlarge the classification outside the, this area, or to uh, transfer the knowledge to another year and so on, of course, this is not enough. So I agree that this solution can be uh, fine if you just want to classify the study area and you don't need, need to every time pass through a database. I was more uh, presenting, a, uh, let's say, a conceptual framework to generate training data sets. So Todd Simon, sorry, uh, I think I pronounced his name correctly. Sorry for that if I didn't say, sorry, does phenology difference from region to region require local expert annotation? Uh, sorry, I didn't get it. Absolutely, yes. In my opinion, the expert, local expert annotator is the best condition, especially for peculiar, um, uh, let's say, study area like Africa or South America that have specific crops with specific seasonality and so on and so forth. This is the best condition. The problem is that you are not always in the condition to, uh, to, to do that. I mean, it's difficult to, 
uh, to every time interact with local expert, but this is the best solution, let's say. Yes, I, I do agree with that. Um, I had one question, uh, selfishly, I'm unmuting my here. Uh, have you had um, any successful engagements, uh, say in Africa, leveraging uh, community mapping approaches for labeling data? I, I know there have been some yes. efforts in the US and um, involving inner city schools, you know, just to sort of build that engagement um, into the remote sensing community and knowledge and learning. Um, sometimes digitization is not seen as a technical art, but but it is a way to engage um, a large audience. Have you had any successes to share um, in, in developing countries where you can engage? Um, Unfortunately but, not. I'm looking a lot in this. I do agree with your selfish uh, requirement because this is a problem. And I would say that all the community will benefit from this. Uh, there are a lot of study in Africa, so there are a lot of maps uh, and sometimes they started to share all the results that they obtained. For instance, they were using, they were doing a very nice urban analysis at high spatial resolution and they were sharing the results. And there is this analysis on the crop uh, that I was reading recently related to some kind of databases uh, that was more administrative, but nothing that I saw shared directly for the community. And it's a pity because Africa, I mean, has different problems. It's not just having climate specific, but it's very peculiar from one region to another. So from Ethiopia, for instance, to Eritrea, the um, conditions are totally different. The size, the kind of cultivation, the kind of soil. So it's very tricky in my opinion, because Europe is more, and also North America in my opinion, I mean, if I'm wrong, some, I mean, somehow it's more homogenized, let's say, but there really, I mean, the, the, also the desert in the middle, in the middle uh, is changing totally the environment. So unfortunately not, but if you find it, please tell me. <laughs> we'll do. It's, a, it's sharing a the same problem. Yeah, I'm very interested. <laughs> um, I think we're at time. I, I don't want 